One of the foundational aspects of information security is controlling what can access resources, how the resources can be accessed, and when. In this lesson, I take a deep dive into the identity lifecycle, including identity creation, identification, authentication, authorization, and deprovisioning. We will also look at DAC, MAC, role-based access control, attribute-based access control, and needed authorization solution attributes. You can download a copy of the study guide associated with this video from above or at the end of the video. The identity lifecycle is a process, a process that includes several working parts, so we need to pause a moment to ensure accurate definitions. An identity defines an entity, human, device, or process. In the identity management process, we call these entities those that access resources subjects. The resources they access are called objects. When a new subject needs to access one or more objects, an administrator creates a secure means of verifying the subject's identity, beginning with assigning it a user ID coupled with one or more authentication factors. The most common factor is something the identity knows, like a password. I cover other factors later in this video. Another consideration is to ensure the identity of a new hire, temporary worker, or vendor. Identity verification includes requiring the person to provide two picture IDs, together with agency verification for temps and employer verification for vendors. Identification is the process of verifying a subject's identity, comparing the authentication credentials provided by the subject with those stored in the owning organization's secure credential storage, like Active Directory. This process is also known as authentication. Although this step provides for a high probability that the subject is who it says it is, it is not perfect, requiring other safeguards, like behavior analytics, to monitor for anomalous behavior by authenticated subjects. Once a subject identity is verified, other safeguards determine what objects this subject can access and what it can do with them. These safeguards, commonly set up with application network and other access control and traffic management lists, enable the process known as authorization. For example, when, the, when an authenticated subject attempts to access an object, the subject's identity is compared with a list of authorized subjects, a list maintained by the object's administrator. If the subject is on the authorized subject list, it's granted access what is sometimes called course authentic authorization. But functional access, what a subject can actually do with the object, is often further controlled with more granular authorization settings, sometimes called fine authorization, maintained for each authorized subject by the object's administrator. As we see later, authorization can also be affected by session characteristics defined and managed in Attribute Access Control Solutions. Once a subject no longer needs to use one or more resources, the organization should remove its ability to see or access those resources. This is known as deprovisioning. For example, when an employee terminates her employment, the organization must ensure she can no longer authenticate most often accomplished by disabling the employee's identification or account used for credential comparison. Once an account is disabled, authentication is no longer possible. We disable accounts instead of deleting them or removing all access control list authorizations because we might have to use them to access information they created or securely stored and to ensure solid audit trails. If an employee changes roles and no longer needs access to one or more resources, but still needs access to others, he is deprovisioned by removing authorization to the resources no longer needed. If possible, authorization should be disabled instead of deleted, maintaining the ability to audit the subject's prior activities. Some organizations try to simplify access to one or more objects by creating accounts shared by more than one subject, 
eliminating the ability to audit who is doing what. This approach is also often used to enable administrative access. This approach is never a good idea for sensitive access to operational technology or business systems that store or manage highly classified or categorized information. Each human or logical entity should be assigned its own unique login ID and authentication factors, enabling auditing and effective monitoring of each subject's activities. The same holds true, especially for administrative access. Managing admin access is considered privileged access management. Managing access that allows changes and additions to systems and network devices, including user creation and management of access control lists. Privileged Access Management, or PAM, is an identity management mechanism provided by vendor-supplied solutions that enables the use of one or more privileged accounts by multiple subjects, requiring special authentication and close auditing. Further, Privileged account passwords can often be automatically changed after use. Let's walk through one example of how this might work when an Active Directory admin needs to check out the admin password from a PAM solution. Our admin needs to access directory services to add new users. First, he logs into the PAM system using two-factor authentication assigned to a unique personal account. This can be his day-to-day -day account. He then requests credentials for access to directory services. The PAM system provides the necessary credentials, sometimes just a temporary, very strong password, and logs the credential issuance event. The admin uses the credentials to log into directory services to make his changes. Meanwhile, the PAM system changes the directory services password so that not even the admin can reuse the old password to access directory services. This is a very simple example. Current PAM solutions provide sophisticated ways to manage privileged accounts, providing clear audit trails, and protecting against lost or stolen passwords. Traditionally, subjects had to log into each object they wanted to access. In most smaller organizations, this is still the case. However, granular logins like this are frustrating to users, slowing productivity, and creating a more complex credential administrative environment. Single sign-on helps with this by enabling a subject to log in once and then authenticate to all subjects needed for business tasks. This is managed via a centralized identity management system integrated with existing directory services. These systems usually have out-of-the-box connectors to popular applications and services, and easy-to-implement APIs for customized connections. Other tools used to enable safe sharing of credentials for a single sign-on include SAML, or Security Assertion Markup Language, OpenID Connect, OIDDC, SPML, or Service Provisioning Markup Language, and Kerberos. We use one or more of three factors to enable subject authentication. Type 1, something the subject knows, like a password or PIN. Type 2, something the subject has, like a smart card or one-time password generator. Or Type 3, something you are, or biometrics. Use of one factor is known as single factor authentication. Strong authentication uses two or more of these factors for authentication, driving down the probability that a threat actor can compromise the credentials to gain access. This strong authentication is known as multi factor authentication and should be used for protecting highly classified or categorized resources. Let's take a deeper dive into these factor types. And as I will continue to remind you, a single authentication factor is no longer enough to protect your most valuable assets. Passwords are the most common type of authentication. However, they're often weak, providing threat actors with easy access, access provided by easy to use and downloadable password cracking applications. 
The passwords are easily cracked because they are either included in a dictionary of any language, represent a common series of characters, or are of insufficient length. This is one list of the most commonly used passwords. Any of these passwords, or those contained in any dictionary, can be cracked in minutes or seconds. The traditional means of maintaining strong password access include a password length of at least 10 characters. Longer passwords are usually used for services. I used to require completely random passwords of at least 20 characters for services. But requiring longer, very complex passwords for human users actually results in weaker authentication, as users write them down where anyone can find them. Passwords that are too complex also result in many help desk calls for password changes, increasing costs, and decreasing productivity. This is why we combine one of the other factors with password use. The password should at least should contain at least one character from each character set. The password must be changed every 30 to 90 days, with the reuse of passwords prohibited. The same password should not be used across multiple resources. The screening of all new passwords to ensure they are not included in dictionaries or commonly used password lists. Lock out the user after a set number of failed login attempts, usually 3 to 5, depending on the sensitivity of the data accessed. Screen the characters as passwords are entered. Now, some of these requirements are changing, as specified in the 2021 NIST password recommendations available at the link above, including the relaxation of the need for complex passwords. So these are the new guidelines. Password length is more important than password complexity. Long passwords, particularly passphrases, are difficult to crack and should have an allowed length up to 64 characters. For example, it's better for a user to create a password like this instead of like this, making password forgetting much less of an issue. Do not enforce password resets. This does not mean that passwords remain safe. Instead, passwords should never be considered safe enough to protect highly classified information. Again, eliminating password resets helps reduce employee frustration and reduces the cost of password management because users often forget their new passwords. Show passwords while typing. Trained users know not to enter passwords while someone is watching. Allowing employees to see what they enter helps ensure they enter the right series of characters, especially if the organization still requires a high level of password complexity. Do not rely on passwords for strong authentication. The password complexity requirement assumes that passwords were key to protecting highly classified categorized data and systems, a poor assumption. Multi-factor authentication, no longer beyond the budgets of even small businesses, is a must when mitigating high levels of risk. Another important consideration is the salting of password hashing. Using a unique salt value for each password hash helps prevent the use of brute force password cracking, cracking that often uses rainbow tables. Because it's recommended that a different password is used for each password, or for each account password, a user should end up, could end up, with a dozen passwords she has to remember. This is why the use of a password manager can securely store and quickly provide all needed passwords. Pa examples of password managers include LastPass and the one I use, 1Password. Another type 1 authentication method is the use of security questions, or cognitive passwords, and they're often used to verify a user's identity, especially when a user needs identity verification after forgetting his password. However, security questions are not very secure. In fact, the DIST password guidelines drop the use of security questions, questions from their list of approved Type 1 authentication factors. 
The problem with security questions is the direct availability of the information used across the internet and inferred information based on social network content and the content of other resources. Examples include, what was your favorite pet's name? What was the model of the first car you drove? What was the name of your school mascot? And where did you go to elementary school? The only way these work for as secure enough authentication factors is if the users enter false information. For example, for the name of a favorite pet, they might enter Yogi the Bear. The problem with entering false information is that the users tend to forget what they entered. Type 2 authentication generally consists of tokens and one-time password devices or apps to support either password or biometric authentication. In general, a token is something that a user carries and presents to a reader for access. An OTP authenticator, like the LastPass iPhone app shown, synchronizes with a server, providing a regularly changing code for each application registered. For example, the user supplies his user ID and password to the authentication server. The authentication server, configured for OTP operation, then requests the OTP that appears on the user's OTP device. The OTP related to the application he's trying to access. Because the user previously set up his OTP application with the authentication server, both, both the user OTP app and the authentication server have the same OTP value. The value us usually changes every 30 seconds and is synced between the server and the user OTP device. Another popular approach is sending a frequently changing OTP to the user via text message. The text message approach is not as secure as the OTP application process. One thing I did not cover in this video is the use of certificates for authentication, another type 2 authentication method. I've covered this in detail in another video shown above on asymmetric encryption. Certificates are an important tool when considering how to authenticate subjects. Type 3 authentication uses what a user is for physical characteristics or behavior. Sensors are used to map physical characteristics, convert them into a value, and then compare that value to one stored for the user, one created when the user was enrolled in the biometrics authentication system. Examples of characteristics used include fingerprints, palm prints, finger and palm dimensions, face, voice, veins, retinas, and irises. Behavior biometrics includes how a user enters data into a system, an approach known as keystroke dynamics. Biometrics are not a silver bullet. Used alone, the risk is still higher than using only a password, and they are associated with two error types. Type 1 errors are known as the false rejection rate, or FRR, the rate at which the authentication system fails to verify the identity of an authorized user. A Type 2 error is known as a false acceptance rate, or FAR, the rate at which the authentication system incorrectly authenticates unauthorized users. As we increase the sensitivity of the biometric sensors, the sensors that scan and measure user characteristics, the false rejection rate increases and the false rejection rate decreases. The point at which both rates are the same is known as the crossover error rate, or CER. While the crossover error rate seems to provide a balanced approach, we need to adjust sensor sensitivity based on what we're protecting. There are times when we might be okay with allowing more false rejections in order to reduce the risk of false acceptance. When selecting a biometric solution, organizations must clearly understand the error rates for each solution assessed. For a detailed look at biometrics, user acceptance considerations, sensor placement, and the associated risks, read the article above. There are five approaches to authorizing subject access. Role-based access control, rule-based access control, mandatory access control, discretionary access control, 
and attribute based access control. Let's look at each. Formally defined in 1992, RBOC, Role Based Access Control, enables object access based on a user's role in the business, only allowing access to information needed to perform business tasks associated with that role. It also enforces least privilege, controlling what the assigned user can do with the data and separation of duties that helps to prevent fraud and costly mistakes. Data owners define roles and what they can access. The roles are usually associated with job ID assigned by HR. Annual data owner reviews of role access are needed to prevent permissions creep, expanding access causes, caused by several factors, including enabling temporary access that is not removed when no longer needed. Rule-based access control uses predefined business rules used to configure application and device barriers. For example, firewall configurations control what traffic can pass to the network in general, and to a network segment specifically, or to a device. Application rules allow or block access based on session characteristics. For example, a business rule might dictate that a manager can approve her employee payrolls, but not her own. Consequently, the payroll application would enforce a rule blocking self-approval of payroll. Mandatory access control uses tagging to control what a subject can access, causing the protected system to protect itself. This tagging is often used in conjunction with RBOC or ABOC. As shown, both the subject and object have classification tags. A subject can access a resource with a lower or equal classification if least privilege, need to know, and separation of duties allow it. MAC is an excellent way to fill gaps left by other authentication authorization safeguards, preventing access because of mistakes or unknown vulnerabilities. MAC is usually not extensively implemented in private industry because it's so complex and expensive to implement and manage. However, it is often a key component in protecting government information, both in government agencies and government contractor processing environments. Discretionary Access Control, or DAC, available out of the box in solutions like the Windows operating system, allows the system owner to decide who gets access to a system and allows the creator of a file to decide who gets access to the file. It's a decentralized approach to managing access control, introducing complexity to the access control process for medium to large organizations, potentially bypassing protection dictated by data value and sensitivity. A small business, one with a handful of users, is likely a good candidate for DAC eliminating the need for assigning or hiring an administrator to manage access. ABOC, or Attribute-Based Access Control, uses traditional access control methods, including role-based access control and access control list, and combines them with analysis of session characteristics, an analysis that determines whether conditions exist needed for access. As shown, ABOC determines resource access capabilities based on a comparison of user and device characteristics to access business policies associated with the resources. 1. The subject requests access to the object. 2. The ABOC access control mechanism assesses the subject attributes, such as assigned role. It also assesses object attributes such as as classification and categorization, and it assesses environment attributes, such as time of day, day of week, and the geographic location of the subject. And lastly, the subject is given some level of access based on session attributes and applicable ABOC business policies. For a more detailed look at ABOC, download the NIST Special Publication SP800 Dash 162 at the link above. Regardless of how an organization implements authorization, the ways to enforce least privilege, separation of duties, and need to know 
An authorization solution should possess key attributes as specified by the CISSP common body of knowledge. It should be fast and operation, simple, and not frustrating to users. It should be scalable, allowing growth and the integration of not only current and future connected devices, both remote and on-premise, and enabling the safe connectivity with business partner networks. It should be comprehensive and adaptable, ensuring auditable management of entities or identities across all cloud and in-house resources, while minimizing user interaction when attempting movement between trust zones and when needing access to multiple objects. It should be maintainable, ensuring a low level of complexity, efficient integration of new lines of business, and changes in user roles that prevent permissions creep. And finally, it should be comprehensible and justifiable to users and management, allowing them to understand the need for all authentication and authorization interruptions to the flow of task completion and associated costs. Well, that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.